Hello everyone, I'm Finola Howard and this is How Great Marketing Works. And today we have another wonderful, inspiring entrepreneur for you all to listen to and speak with, through me, I suppose. Um, and I want to introduce you to this inspiring entrepreneur and her name is Robin Rice. And Robin, I have come across a few years ago and I would best describe Robin as this is how she puts it on her LinkedIn profile because there's so much more to Robin and you'll discover that very shortly. But she would describe herself as an executive level thinking partner to leaders and top executives around the world. Now I know a little bit more about Robin because I know she's also involved in social change projects that she has pioneered that are wonderfully simple and deep in their impact. She's also the creator of an amazing masterclass called The Significant Year. And I want to talk about that with you and the importance of the masterclass. But let's first meet Robin. So, hey, Robin, how hey, are you? thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm delighted to have you. I think the first thing I'd love to say is how we came in contact with each other, because that's a really interesting story, because we know each other a long time now. We do, and we... Full disclosure, we are really good friends now. <laughs> so really good friends we now. Are deep, deep, like you're one of my deepest friends now. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, so we met- the same for me. <laughs> <laughs> so there's our problem. So. Hope is not one-sided. <laughs> yeah, no, no, mutual, mutual. Yeah. So how did we meet? It's a good thing. Like, I remember I was looking for someone to do some marketing for me, or maybe I wasn't even looking, but I was seeing people on there or something. And your picture was on there and I was, you know, in that way, when you know soulful things, I was like, her, <laughs> her, I don't know, but her. Um. <laughs> and I just remember knowing that I had to connect with you and, um, and that I wanted to work with you. And, and uh, I didn't know we'd be such good friends over so many years. And you've worked on so many, so many things with me now. So and it's been a pleasure. I love what you said, and this is one of the things that, that I love about you is this amazing way with words and with language, because I think also, I mean, it's too small to talk of you as a coach or a mentor or a thinking partner. Yay, I'm Work. glad that's true. <laughs> yeah, no, but I know this. I know this from the work that we do, and I know this from the work that you do and the changes and the impact that you have had on so many people. And you've had the, this impact on people at a very high level and a very focused way, one-to-one -one, with these leaders and change makers in the world, because there is a very definite recurring theme here, which is about changing the world. And one of the things that I like about you, of the many things that I like about you, is that you have this level of working with somebody at these change makers across the world. You have this level of being able to work with changing the world yourself in these social change projects, which are very, um, they just deliver to across to, to a specific target audience is perfectly marketed. And then this other level of inspiring and teaching and guiding people on how to become a change maker themselves. This yeah. is very deep work. Well, it's important. It's, I mean, I can't do it all myself. <laughs> you can change the world, but not by yourself. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Love that. I mean, I, I, I think change is, you know, I, as a little girl, I saw the world in, um, in very challenging times, you know, I, I didn't have an easy childhood. And I looked at this world and I just said, look, either we have to make it better or ugh, I don't even want to be here. Um, and it was that. Tell us it about was, your story, because it's an important story, but it's not the only story. That's something, I mean, I think when you share your story of, you know, your kind of founding story or your background story, it's not all of who you are, but it's probably a very um, informative starting point to show how you've reached the depth that you have. Yeah. Well, it would take a long time to tell that story. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying to write an autobiography um, of some kind uh, to tell that story. Um, you know, and you know what I forgot, Robin? I'm sorry. Um, You're a published author. <laughs> yes, I actually. I, people often forget this part. It's so funny. It's like, oh, and by the way, there's like seven books. And they're like, oh, did you write? <laughs> Painfully, I have to say. 
Yeah. But yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I think for me, life was difficult. Lots of lives are difficult in the early stages. I had a particularly heavy dose of loss as a child, um, like repeated, very, very significant losses. Um, so I was dealing with the bigger questions from even five years old, which you would think a five-year-old isn't looking at that, but I was, I remember looking at that and feeling like, you know, this doesn't make sense. Death doesn't make sense. Um, the way people handle death doesn't make sense. This, how can this being, sorry, that's, how can this being that I love be gone? And yeah. so I didn't have the luxury of happy-go-lucky. I just, it just wasn't built into my, into my life. Mm -hmm. And so again, it, it was very, very challenging on so many fronts. And, um, and then, you know, for me, I had a very powerful awakening experience at age um, 35. And so right. I can honestly say, very honestly, that if you'd asked me on any given week, other than maybe a few spectacular weeks, like when my kids were born, um, you know, would you rather have lived this year or this week or not lived it? I would have said, I would rather not have lived, okay. which is pretty strong language. Um, and then at, after this awakening experience, which I did not look for, did not know what it was, didn't know it existed in the world, um, this greater consciousness that occurred at that time, I've never had a week like that since. Like never. Well, let's let's discuss time. this. <laughs> but let's discuss this really quickly because it's important. This whole concept of awakening, and yeah. but let's put it in a context of its relevance to. Let's call it the real world. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's up for grabs, but let's call it the real world because I want to be very clear about how we have this discussion because too often this area of awakening is kind of shoved to the side yet deeply so many people know it to be an important part and some people you know don't use it but I'd like not for it to be relegated to the side I yeah. think it's something that is a tangible um tool you will you will express it much better than me but it's something very tangible that can be used to help us in life to navigate it and something yeah. that's been untapped yeah yeah I'm not so uh <laughs> articulate well, I, mean, I think there's a lot of ways to talk about it and you know one of the things is i don't care if someone else is on board with any particular language or or whatever it doesn't it doesn't matter to me um there are levels of consciousness in, you know, every person, levels of maturity of, of consciousness or whatever. I think one of the bigger challenges that a lot of people have is that the experience is so close to what you would call a spiritual experience that it gets relegated to spirituality and spirituality is relegated to not the real world. But yeah. consciousness isn't, it, it can have a spiritual interpretation, but it's a thing in and of itself. Just consciousness is a thing in and of itself. Um, you can be politically woke, right? You can be yeah. conscious of your body. You can be conscious of your, um, you know, your education is a kind of consciousness of how do we approach life? Do we approach it academically? Do we approach it with, you know, a multi sensory awareness. There's just all kinds of consciousnesses out there. So for me, this was a more um, sudden, you know, stroke of consciousness that came on. And then I had to figure out, well, how do I be in the world with this? How do I do this? How do I make this work? because I'm really pragmatic, right? I'm, yeah. I'm super grounded. And I, I'm like, if it doesn't work in this world, it can't be very useful. It can't, you know, it's nice, but it, you know, can it work in this world? So I've spent really every year since, 22 or so years since saying, how do we make this actually valuable to the experience that we're in right now? How do I deal with this person who's here who's got a life, who's got desires, who's got all those things, and has an interesting perspective um, from a consciousness standpoint. 
And then that's what I work with with my clients and those people that work with me in my groups and that sort of thing too, is I really want to bring you to a higher level of consciousness, which means thinking about your thinking. If you, if you only take it that far, think about your thinking, think about how you think, because if you don't think about how you think, you're not conscious. Like you're just thinking and it's a, you're a machine, you're a pre-programmed, you know, 57 year old machine <laughs> that has lots of experiences that thinks you're independently doing things, but most of the things you're doing are cultural and most of the things you're doing are the way that you did it before. And, you know, we know a lot about neuroplasticity now, we know we can learn, but we got to start with this. So I don't know if that, <laughs> that's all over the no, place. I think it's a really great way to explain it because thinking about your thinking is being conscious, this idea that there are many types of consciousness. I think that's really useful. I mean, I was going to interrupt at one point and say, that's really brave. But in fact, it just makes sense. We're not even in the realms of bravery. It's yeah, not at all. It's just, it's, it, it just is, right? A consciousness just is. And you have more and more of it or more and more access to it or however you want to put it. But um, in my particular case, I don't know why I got a, you know, a big dose of it at a particular age, a particular moment, but it changed the rest of my life. And now I know that the more conscious you are, the more smart you are, if you will, with yourself, the smarter you are in the world. Um, and I particularly like working with super smart people. Um, that's not the only people I work with, but I do happen to enjoy working with super smart people because super smart people are very often super dumb about themselves, <laughs> right? Like they, they put all of their chips on the outward educational, creative, genius aspect, and then, you know, they'll get around to themselves later. <laughs> so they, you know, I usually come in when they get around to themselves. I mean, do you think that's changing? Because you know that in the tech industry, they have moved, they have moved all of those tech superstars, have moved in their thinking, they've changed their thinking, and even, and I suppose when they get older too, they're totally uh, moving their thinking towards, I'm, I'm actually watching the Bill Gates kind of yeah. piece on Netflix at the moment, which is very interesting. So he's flipped his thinking as he got older, and historically, even Cornell, all of the guys, you know, the steel industry, all of that time, they all flipped their thinking as they get old, got older. But that's kind of happening sooner now. Yes. I mean, that's a maturity that happens. It's built into our growth process. You know, people think you, you know, you graduate, you know, college, and then you actually are just going to be you for the rest of your life. And in fact, your older years are incredibly shaping years. We are missing such an opportunity in the world because these older years are, you know, you, your self-consciousness drops, which means consciousness itself can come in more. Yes. You know, your, your worry, your anxiety, um, hopefully is dropping. You don't, you don't care what, you know, you, you don't care whether you're wearing lipstick or not. Like I said, you were wearing beautiful lipstick. I'm like, this is lipstick, but it doesn't, you know, whatever. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. Right? You know, like I am not my lipstick. I am not my clothes. I am not any of those things. I'm, you know, I, and I don't, if I had to wear something different today, I, I could care less, right? I just don't care. I try not to show up in a sweatshirt for something professional, but I don't really care myself. But the point is, is that as you grow older, these things naturally drop away. And we have very little cultural language and knowledge of this, that we're going to grow. So of course, you're going to change positions based on how you've grown and what you've learned. And, and why shouldn't you change positions? Um, and, you know, to be honest, the whole, if you, if you do your research on the whole Silicon Valley, it all started out with drugs. I mean, really, that's what, we, we got Silicon Valley by people who were on drugs. So everybody has an internal experience. Every single person has an internal experience. Do you think this consciousness is required, this level of consciousness is required at a younger age now because of the world we live in? Absolutely. You have a whole world as your neighborhood and our brains and our psyches and all of this are not adapted yet to handle, you know, we have a natural biological built in desire to protect our family, to care about our neighborhood, to see a wrong and right it, all of those kinds of things. Well, now you're seeing the wrong in 54 different places before you even get out of your morning news. And so 
the beings that we are are not prepared for this. And I, I personally believe consciousness is really our only answer to that. The only, the mm. only um, evolutionary leap that we can take is going to be a, a leap in consciousness. Yeah, I love that. Tell us a little about, about the work that you would do. And I know you can't say much, but tell us a little bit of where, what it would be like to work with you at that top level, that one-to-one -one level as a, you know, a leader or top exec. What's that like? What's that like to work? What does that, yeah, how does that show itself? Another big question. Um, because I don't have anything scripted. I, the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to peer very deeply into the constructs that you have about yourself. I'm going to go in and I'm going to say, where did you put yourself together really well? And where didn't you, right? Where did you miss a beat or where did you skip a grade or where did something go off that's now showing up as a problem in your life? You know, people don't come to me when everything's hunky-dory and truthfully, no one's life is hunky-dory. That's just all, that's just an image, right? So, and everybody has the same challenges and the same problems just at a different scale. You know, you want to scale your business, well, scale your problems, right? So, um, but, but, you know, everyone has ways in which they've adapted and coped with life and, and all of that sort of thing. And everyone has limits in their thinking because they're just one person, right? And they're looking out. So having someone think with you and say, well, what about this? Or what I like to do is, you know, challenge the premise of the question. So come, someone comes in with a question and says, why can't I X, Y, Z? before we go into why can't I X, Y, Z, I'm like, why are you asking about X, Y, Z? Like X, Y, Z isn't important. Really, is it? Oh, to you it is. Okay, so this is really important to you, this X, Y, Z. Let's look at why that's important before we go try to solve it. Because people are smart. People are really smart. We're emotionally savvy. We're psychologically savvy these days. We're, we're smart people. If you haven't answered a problem that you've had in your life for a long time, you don't have the right question, for sure. You do not have the right question. So if we don't go and look at the question and go behind the question, and it sounds like psychology, and I suppose, you know, to some degree, as we all are psychologically savvy, that's in there. But I'm just actually really interested in your brain synapses and how did you get from A to B to C, and is that working? Because you wouldn't come to me if it wasn't working. Or if it was working, right? You'd be, you're coming to me because something's not working. And I'm going to, so if you work with me, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to lend you my confidence that we can fix this. We can change this. We can shift this. We can grow this. And that's one of the things that I absolutely know because I've worked with so many people over the years. And I don't know how I'm going to help you, but I know that if we both feel it, I can and I will. And do they does do do your clients come with a specific task or question or objective in mind? Sometimes, sometimes there's ten objectives. Um, all they know is that they're at a place in their life that this isn't working anymore, and. I, I specifically chose in this case, now I, I work with a lot of different levels of, you know, influence or whatever, but in, in the main work, the rainmaker work, I, I work with leaders and people who are influencers because I figure that's the best way I can get, you know, I can change the world most if I'm changing influencers. Um, but they are coming very often with problems that because they haven't been able, they're smart, they haven't been able to solve them for a long period of time. They've talked to a lot of people over the years. They are actually pretty much hopeless. They're like, yeah, well, you can work with other people and I hear that you do, but you can't actually help me. Um, because we convince ourselves that we're not actually helpable in certain areas. You're like, you're, I mean, again, you don't come unless you're sort of defeated. And so when you're defeated, um, I have to look at why you're defeated before we even look at solutions. And, and then, yeah. At that level. Rambler, sorry. <laughs> no, I love it. Let me just say it bluntly. Who would admit that they were defeated? Or am I naive in asking that question? 
No, 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 not, not in public. Yeah. Right? They're not going to admit that in public, especially if they're a public figure. Even, even picking yeah. up a phone at that level, I would oh, make they- yeah, no one's going to call me and say, Robin, come help. I'm defeated. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but something inside of them doesn't believe that, that anything's actually going to change because it hasn't changed for so long. Mm. Right. And that's the kind of work that I do is I work with people for whom the answer hasn't come for a long time or they're in a totally new place and they just don't know how to handle it. You know, I work with um, women a lot who are in, you know, the public eye. And for example, one of the things that comes up all the time is, you know, I'm a nice person, but I have to say no by email 200 times a day. And maybe I have to even become impersonal and have an assistant say no on my behalf. And they're saying no, not just to, you know, um, someone they actually don't want to have lunch with, but their grandmother's best friend who happens to be in town. Oh my God, how do I say no to her? But there's 54 grandmother's best friends in a given week. So how do you handle a new level of you, a new identity of you? Um, and, and identity is a big piece of consciousness. Are we conscious of our working identity versus our public identity? And how do they converse with each other, if you will? Yeah, so, interesting. But, but there is in each of us, every one of us, some part of our lives where at some point we're going to feel defeated. And so... What, I have to ask this question. Yeah. We always have to ask it. Why? <laughs> how... I think you've already answered, but I'll ask anyway. When someone chooses you, why are you different to other people? Because you are very clearly different to others. Yeah. Well, Um, that's where that consciousness piece comes in. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I don't know why I was shaped the way that I was. Mm. Life shaped me the consciousness that came upon it shaped me. But what it did was it allowed me, and and I was was very clear. So I have this massive consciousness experience and the very first thing that I'm saying in my head, well, the very first thing is took you long enough. I can't believe you let me sleep for 35 years, right? And I'm like, who is saying that to who are you saying it to, right? I was watching this kind of thing. But then the other thing I said was, I am not going to be good. I'm not wearing white robes. I'm not doing the whole savior thing. I'm not doing a guru thing. I'm just not doing any of that stuff because I knew it wasn't what was needed in the world. So you have the benefit of my having had that experience and the natural, unusual gifts that come with it, which we get really woo woo when we start talking about those. Um, But but the clarity of sight that I have is really what's different. I have a clarity of sight that's very penetrating and very quick and usually almost always on target, but I'm willing to be wrong. And, and if I am wrong, we explore that because I'm not perfect by by far. I'm glad to hear it. (laughs) What a relief. And so my next, um, let's talk about clarity of sight. And what I'd like to talk about Clarity Sight is the Social Change Projects 3 I'm thinking of at the moment. You have two very strong, very impactful social change projects. One is called, was called Stop the Beauty Madness. The second one was called Your Holiday Mom. Um, and the third one is one you're going to bring out and we'll talk about it in a second. Let's, the thing I love about these, these social change projects is that you have had that clarity of sight to focus in down to something so, so, that seems so small, such a small idea, but it's an enormous idea simultaneously. It's a small idea in that it's capable of being actioned and having impact. And it's a huge idea because it's capable of impact. You know what I mean? That it has it will make a difference. Yeah. And I'd love you to talk about those two. And then in a moment, let's talk about the new, the one that's coming, which is called Good, Good Night. Oh, 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 don't, don't be putting it out there yet. We're not launched. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We will talk about it in abstract. <laughs> we can talk about it in abstract. You can, i let you lead the way on that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And I'm uh, thank you for letting me live, live, live over you. <laughs> 
Okay, forgive me for that. No, we rehearse any so of it. exciting, though. It's so exciting. So let's talk about the first two. Yeah. Stop the beauty madness yeah. and your holiday mom. And the thing that I'd like you to talk about, one is describe the idea really quickly, but what I think would be of interest to entrepreneurs out there and also social entrepreneurs out there is this idea that you can take this big passion project that you have and make it actionable simply. Like, for yeah. example, your holiday mom cost $11. Yeah, a year. Yeah. yeah. You know, so, the URL might have gone up to 16 now, but um, <laughs> yeah, big deal, lovely. right? <laughs> yeah, so I'm very strategic in the design of the social change. I am going for viral from the very first thought. I'm going for viral. And I know that the way, and viral is different levels and different things. There are, you know, there are certain viral that are just way out of the league of what I've done. But what I've done by myself and with a group is, is actually pretty, um, pretty big numbers, you know. So um, Stop the Beauty Madness ended up being covered in 30 magazines, major magazines, um, or, or in major magazines of 30 different countries. Um, and we stopped counting at 30, so it was actually more than that, uh, which was just astounding for something that, you know, I and a handful of people who were supporting me and working with me and helping me get it out there. Um, uh, that's just amazing to me. Uh, so uh, I like to say nobody pays me and nobody stops me. So if you don't pay me, you can't stop me from doing whatever I want. And so I look at it and I say, you know what? I'm really sick of the beauty standards because I'm suffering from them. Like it's not just the world is suffering and I have this opinion. It's like, no, we're, we're all suffering and we're getting it wrong because it's cultural. It's not just me. If every woman feels ugly, then you've got a culture problem, not a personal ugly problem. Right? Yeah. So, but if I feel this way and I feel it passionately, which I did growing up and, and I have at different times in my life. If I feel that passionately, then, then it's gotten into my system. It's gotten into my psyche. So what I did with Stop the Beauty Madness was I put about 25 ads together. I used stock photos, and it was so successful, I had to pay a whole lot more money for them. <laughs> um, and uh, even the Today Show couldn't, couldn't pay the fees of, you know, um, of uh, putting it on. We had, you know, they wanted more money for, for the success of that. So even though we filmed it, it never actually went out. Um, but, uh, but the idea was I wanted to talk about the truth and I wanted to see it in a big way. So I got focus groups and I said, okay, well, what's, you know, what's this, um, subgroups experience? What's it like to be young, old, fat, thin? Um, what's it like to be, uh, white, black, um, Asian? What is it like in this whole thing? And like, what is the message that's going to come out of this? So we had really striking in your face ads, really in your face ads. And so you think you're going to see a typical beauty ad, you know, because of the stock photo that I chose. And then you see something like, you know, uh, uh, you know, a super, super, super thin woman, for example. And it says, um, my boyfriend says I gained a few pounds. I just love how he's always looking out for me. You know, and every woman knows, every woman knows how painful that is. You have an elderly woman who's absolutely stunning. And it says, you know, old isn't ugly, it's invisible, because that is the experience of the older woman. You, you are literally on the street, no longer acknowledged and seen as you walk down the street anymore. Um, and I've even experienced that, and I'm not that old yet. But, you know, um, especially when I was in Silicon Valley. So uh, all of these things came together, and I just put them out there. It was how I designed the group around it in the pre-phase, that is what actually creates the viral part. So this becomes our project. I bring in a focus group. I've done that with my latest one. You know, for your holiday mom, moms write letters to LGBTQ youth every um, Thanksgiving to New Year's Day. We just write a letter, post it on a blog. The blog is what costs the 11 or $16. Um, we have volunteers that edit and make sure that it's in the right tone and all of that sort of thing. Um, the day that the mom's letter is posted, she's on there to respond to the comments and the comments are heart wrenching. Uh, we had, I think we had something like uh, 30,000 interactions in our first 40 days, something like that. Um, and now we're in our seventh year. 
And every year we save lives. We know that because they actually write that in the comments. I was going to kill myself tonight, but I found this site. And all I did was take this very basic human need, which all of us have, which is a mom's love, and say, if your mom doesn't love you, can't accept you, I will. And you know, here's what it's like to sit at our table where we've got Hanukkah or we've got Christmas or we've got whatever. Sorry, you have to sit next to crazy Uncle Joe, but someone does every year, it's your turn. You know? um, and we make it very, very uh, visual and, and sensual from a standpoint of you can smell the cookies, you can smell the turkey, whatever it is, and you, you experience what it's like if I were bringing you into my home and sitting new, I mean, you and I are gonna go for a walk down the lane, and we're gonna talk about your life, and I'm gonna tell you I think you're amazing. And that virtual experience, that sensory experience actually changes us. It changes this sense that maybe my mom doesn't love me or can't accept me right now, but someone does. And so these very fundamental, you know, you ask why, does it, why is it a small thing? It's a small thing because it's very specific in one, mm. one area, one message, one thought, but I make sure it's a universal thought. And that's what allows it to have big impact. If every single one of us has some kind of experience with rejection from our mothers, say, regardless of even if you know, you're LGBT, there are lots of people you know, are part of your holiday mom that, that aren't young people, that aren't LGBTQ even. They're like, I just miss my mom because she died several years ago or whatever. Um, so those things all come together, this very specific focus, this very specific message, but a universal message. Again, um, I'm really long-winded with you. Sorry if I'm no, going. You're not, not because it's so powerful, Robin. Yeah, it's so powerful. It is very narrowly focused. That's this grounded nature that you have. And it's heart-wrenching. Yeah, it's absolutely heart-wrenching. And, and simultaneously, thank God, thank, thank whatever, <laughs> you know. Yeah. That you've had this, ability to see consciously clearly what could make a difference yeah it's the cultural message every time for me to me it's like where has culture got this wrong where has society got this wrong where, where is there a hurt a very deep and powerful hurt that is actually shaping us that could be somehow relieved you know and then from there we, we can deal with the details and we can deal with, you know, how are we going to express this? And that's a, that's a matter of creativity. It's a matter of, you know, I mean, the other thing I would say is that's a, a component of all of them is it's, it's so fundamental that it's obvious once you see it, but because, because of our culture, we don't see it until, you know, we see it in ourselves, but we don't see it collectively. So I want to look at it and say, how is this collectively an issue? Mm -hmm. And if it's collectively an issue, maybe you're not as screwed up as you think, right? And that gives us some relief, like, oh, wow, this isn't just me. It's not just me that feels ugly, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm not even rational about whether I'm ugly or not. I have absolutely no idea. But even if I did, it wouldn't be universal mm -hmm. of what people thought of what I looked like unless I'm talking about culture as a whole. And that's where the problem is. Yeah. So that's, that's where we go with these. And the new one, I, I am not going to put the name out there just yet. Sorry about that. Um, but uh, we're, we're tackling loneliness um, as a direct core. Talk about something universal. They're now saying three in four um, Americans are, and this seems to be in, in the more wealthy countries, especially at the moment, because, you know, we don't need each other anymore. We, we don't need, we think we don't need each other anymore. We think, um, we, we think that there's this, uh, we can afford to live alone as a financial decision, but as an emotional and a psychological decision, we can't afford to be alone all the time. We will deteriorate. We, we, we were not made to be alone all the time. And many, many people are very alone. They're alone at work. Sometimes they're alone in their own families. They might have people around them, but they don't feel understood. And so this concept of loneliness, you know, again, I've taken one tiny little thing that we're gonna work with that has a universal message and we're going to put it out there. And, and, uh, and I've already got a focus group. I've got about 100 people. They're helping me choose the logo. They're helping me choose the music. They're, that's coming up next. They're helping me you know, do some pieces around it so that 
one, I'm not in a vacuum where I can make a big mistake as I have before. And two, um, I, I get people who feel like it's not just my project, it's our project. Mm -hmm. And when it's our project, we have a hundred people wanting to share our project and take ownership. And I want them to take ownership. I want them to feel like I was a part of this. I supported this early on and now look where it's going and, and, and share it that way. And that's the, that's the inherent viral uh, factor. Well, we will share it too. Yay! <laughs> So you will have to come back and talk about it when it's I ready. will, I will. <laughs> <laughs> because it's so very interesting. So I love that. I love that you can make this difference by how you see things. There's one other thing I want to talk to you about today. That is um, your reach in terms of, like there's already significant reach here with the your... Um, leader your clients that are leaders and change makers and then with the social change projects but you also do um have a great a um resource for everybody called be who you are.com which yeah. is an academy um of great learning and <laughs> <laughs> how to be who you are <laughs> uh, but you have a particular master class now master classes are very interesting to me because mm, by the very name masterclass, you know, it's up a level, you know, pushing forward growth, very of great interest and great popularity with uh, many online course creators. Um, but this one's a bit different and it's, it's a year long program and it's called a significant year. And I know you've won uh, rolling out it now at the moment, but it will start in January. But let's talk about the significant year. And I have a complete disclaimer here because I'm on the current Significant. It's amazing. Finola finally took one of my courses. Oh, and I've taken lots of your courses. I oh, know, and I, one of my live courses. <laughs> so this is really powerful and I wanted to share it. And in fact, in my own group, I've shared uh, some stuff yesterday about it because there's a point when you grow, because I'm always very interested in growth, right? And there's a point when you can reach stasis that you can get stuck or you can get, you know, you're kind of just, you know, or you're stretching, you know, it's this piece where you kind of need to ask for help. You need to have to be in a place to help move you to the next stage. And um, I am lucky enough to, uh, to um, be accepted because you have to apply for this course. <laughs> And it's a masterclass and it's called a significant year. It's for um, makers. It's for, I'm going to let you talk about it in a second. But the thing that attracted me to it was that it was consistent. It would be powerful. It would be around people who were at, a, at the top of their game, that, they, that we would support each other and that we had work to do, but we had work to do for a specific objective. And the thing that the thing that I think that you add that's quite interesting is I might come saying I want to write a book or I might come particularly for me, I came saying I want to scale. And part of that is a book. Uh, but the other part that Robin adds to this quite uniquely is an essence based change. And I think that's very interesting because that's the piece that stops us. So and I think you're amazing at unlocking that. Uh, and I advocate this strongly. <laughs> so um, let's talk about this because this is a unique way of doing a masterclass. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's several components to it. You know, you have the, what I call six by six, which is this inner inquiry that goes deeper and deeper into what ends up being 12 themes over the course of 36 weeks. So you have deep learning that goes on with that. And that's, um, that's lesson based. And then we have our one-on-ones. We have, you know, uh, six of those over the course of the time. And then we have the group calls, which uh, people love and, and end up going over time most of the time because you're supporting each other. So, you know, first of all, I think because, you know, you're, you're about marketing and business and that sort of thing, I think it's interesting to look at the whole piece. So, you can go to be who you are.com and take training your inner warrior for free. We've now had more than 15,000 people take it. It's one of my best courses ever. And I wanted to make it available to anyone. And I didn't want to have to 
you know, wait to convince you to fork over your 299. And because of that, we've been able to give away, I don't know, maybe like $3 million worth of the course or something, um, which again, it actually sold for that. So those aren't just inflated numbers. Um, so you have that free and then you have my Rainmaker, which is uh, uh, pricey. And, and I say this um, slightly tongue in cheek, but it's actually kind of a reality is that people who have a lot of money that pay me for the one-on-one -on -one work, because we're going to do really deep work, we're going to do really powerful work, we're going to make major transformation, you need to be invested in that, right? So that's not inexpensive. Um, however, that also helps me pay for all my social change projects. Yeah. So. You know, it's not just my lifestyle, right? It's, it's, that's, that's my funding model. But what I didn't like was that there wasn't anything in between. Mm. So in between is the significant year and it's not inexpensive, but it's also totally workable. And actually this is the very first time in a long time that I'm allowing payments, I'm exp experimenting with that for people. Um, but the idea is, is that we are now more and more a freelance-based society. We are entrepreneurs. We have every tool available to us to create things. We can create our own website. We can write our own books. We can do, you can do anything. You make, make anything these days. So we are, the, the maker instinct inside of us is very happy. But it's also very overwhelming because you've got to learn all of these different things that you need to do. And you have to learn by trial and error and who do you trust and all those things. And since I've done so many of those things, I've published books, I've published websites, I've built lots of websites, built social change projects on all of those things. I knew I could bring that to a group setting um, and, and offer that. But more important than that, because I don't want to be the guru, is that I can bring together a group of people. And this is one of my superpowers. Um, over the years, people have always said, I love your class, but I really love who you brought to the table. Yeah. Um, and, and by the way, not everybody's top, top. That, that'll intimidate them to think, oh, well, I can't, I can't join this. If you're smart, if you're doing it, or if you want to be doing it, if you're ready to do it, if you're going to write a book, if you're going to start a business, you're going to upscale your business, you're going to do whatever. As long as you actually have some success behind you in some form and you're smart and you're really, really ready, then, then you can join us. Uh, also, if you're a woman, because this is a woman's group in particular. I like a particular feel for this, for women entrepreneurs that um, women you know, can, can be in that environment. So- can I ask you why? <laughs> no, not politically correct to answer. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's you. I love men. I, trust me, I love men. Um, I think men are amazing, but men process very differently than women, and women share differently when men are in the room. That shouldn't be true, um, and it isn't always true, but when we deal that essence-based change and we work with something very deep and personal inside of us, it's, it's just, in my experience, women tend to share more and more authentically when they're not, I'm, they're, they're afraid to be judged, really, is what it yeah, is. Yeah, but I think it's really important to state that, like, I think it's okay. I think it's always okay to have a group just for women, but I think it's also really important that we say why. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I, you know, we'll, we'll rail against a group just for men. Um, but we won't, you know, so we, we do have to say why in some ways, but there's, there's a lot of reasons. Well, I've had, I, I mean, I was involved with, uh, uh, women's initiative several years ago, pre Facebook, pre social media. And I was contacted by the employment equality legislation here in Ireland of why men weren't allowed. So yeah. I think it's, it's okay. <laughs> you know, it's important yeah. to say it, you know, yeah. And, and keep in mind, I have a transgender um, adult son, mm -hmm. and I also know that many people are not in the bodies that they, that they you know, um, feel comfortable with. So for me, regardless, if you have a inter an interest in approaching it from the feminine, then I would consider very, very much consider bringing someone in who was in a male body who had this way of thinking, but this is really capitalizing on a way of thinking that women seem to already have intuitively um, gotten. And, uh, and we don't have to start with education 101, if you will, on that particular piece. So it's a judgment call, but it's, you know, it's a very particular, 
it's a very particular approach and um and th those are my reasons they may or may not get me in trouble but <laughs> but those are my reasons i i think it's it shouldn't get you into trouble yeah I, I i want more i also think i want more women to be successful in the world like i just want to support that process and i as a woman i do understand that better i understand i'm not cutthroat i don't i'm not a cutthroat person i'm not ever going to be a cutthroat person it's not how i'm interested in being out there not to say that all men are cutthroat but there's a culture of cutthroat that i know women are backing away from business because they have rejected that and i hear that at all levels right? Even the very top levels. They're like, I just don't want that next promotion because I know where I'm going and I don't want to go there. Um, yeah. So we have, to, we have to work on that. You know, that's sometimes maybe that's the, the issue they come with is like, I don't want the next level. I don't want to scale. And here's why I don't want to scale. You know, I don't want to be, you know, whatever. So, or here's the conflict with my scale because I can share this very openly here. That was one of my things, my own conflict as a woman or as a person or as Fanola with scale. And it's very interesting. I find the dynamic of the women, they're powerful. Yeah. And there is a sense of allowing. And what I mean by allowing is that we have space to be our messy selves. And then we have space to be simultaneously our professional selves. You know, that because there are many dimensions and this this is also true for men anyway the different dimensions of of the human being but what i when i reflect on it and i spoke to one of the people on the group during the week and we talked about how some of us are really strong here and then we're crap over here right, right, <laughs> right. are really strong there where we're crap are you know what i mean and it's but we just accept it of all of us and together we rise, you know, that kind of idea. Yeah, it's true of all of us. I mean, the image is, is that we have to have everything together on every level and nobody does. If you, if you allocate all of your resources to becoming an engineer and none of them, you know, to becoming a psychologist, you're going to have an imbalance in what you know, right? That's just how it works. Mm. Um, and, and by no means am I in the gender or, you know, question here. I'm just saying this is just a, just a fact of life. If, if you are particularly rewarded for a particular gift and skill that you've put out there all over the years, and now your life journey is saying to you, okay, we're going we're gonna to back away from that one and work on some remedial stuff that you got kind of missed. That's really threatening. That's really scary. And so you approach it with compassion, like everybody's stuff is, some, is worthy of compassion and I have true compassion for the stuff. And as you also know, then I'm very logical, you know, and I'm like, okay, and here and here and here is how you're going to go about changing that because you're, the fact that it's coming up tells me you're ready to change it. So here's how we're gonna do it. And, um, you know, I have this, uh, this, this constant thing where people say to me, yes, Robin, but how? I know I'm supposed to grow. I know I'm supposed to change. I know I'm supposed to evolve, but how? And, and that how is managing our brain synapses. That how is managing our habits. That how is uh, getting past fears. I mean, there's lots of things that are the how. And then just thinking differently. Like, again, if you had the right problem in your head, you probably would have solved it by now. Yeah. So you need someone to help you get the right problem so you can go about solving it. Yeah, but it even, it even comes back, we are, none of us are islands. We need to know when to ask for help. Yeah. And by the way, back to the male, female thing, I just want to say that the only one I'm doing that with is, um, is the significant year. Rainmakers, lots of them are men, and Training Your Inner Warrior, lots of people are men that take that. So, yeah. I love men. I think they're great. They're awesome. I know you do. I know. I mean, I'm not, <laughs> I think, I just think it's, uh, worth sharing that it is that kind of group because we need it yeah and and look when you when you sign up with me i what i don't reject people easily if you've signed up you're probably interested so you're probably you know really along the way you might not be quite ready or you know you you there might be some things that that make it so that we, I know I can't deliver for you. But the main criteria that I have when someone applies is 
at the end of the year, can you look back and say, wow, that was a magical major movement year for me in my work, in myself, in my essence, and all of those things. And if I don't think I can say that, I'm not going to, I'm not going to have you waste your money. Yeah. And I like that. I also like very clearly that you bring us to that every week, every week. Yeah. Like, okay. Will, will you have a significant year if you do this? Will you have a significant year when you reflect on this? And I like that we're not, um, that you definitely ground us and bring us back to the accomplishment of stuff. Yes, we're doing essence-based work as well. And I suppose we should clarify what does, what is essence-based work? Yeah, so it's less tangible but it's fundamental. It's some essence inside of us. So you have something that's inside. Maybe it's um, a particular fear of failure. Maybe it's um, an anxiety. Maybe it's, um, and, and, and I don't mean, we don't do therapy. I'm not a therapist. So, so um, people will have therapists as well and hopefully take some of the stuff to them. But, um, but, but this, on the tangible level, we can say, okay, I'm gonna scale my business by X. I'm going to write this book. I'm going to, you know, and it is project based. You've got to choose a project as part of the year. You don't have to know what it is when you start, but we're going to work on it all year because I want, I want you to have something in your hands when we're done. Um, but along that way, that's how I figure out where you're breaking down inside your head, like why you're not writing the book, why you're not doing these things, figuring those things out. And so then, um, you know, the, the essence is, okay, uh, why am I always only comfortable to a certain level of success? Mm. Why, um, or I want to be comfortable with uh, everyone in my family knowing what I really do, which is, uh, you know, I'm a healer or, you know, something that is fundamental to the bigger picture, but you haven't been able to make you know, real movement with. Now, when I work with my Rainmakers, we take on, you know, eight, 10, 12 of those. <laughs> um, in the class, we take on one. Yeah. So. I recommend it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's so. really fun as well. It's really <laughs> fun. Like everybody's like, these are my significant friends and can we have a WhatsApp group and, you know, all those things. So. Yeah, that's good. Um, you know, things. I want to ask you one final question. And that is, think about the audience here right so the audience is entrepreneurs and business owners okay and if you were to give them three pieces of advice to walk away from this with what would those three pieces of advice be wow see now you're asking me to be very general not specific because i don't, don't know specific. Are. <laughs> and there's three man, oh, uh i don't know um you when you're when you become an entrepreneur you get to decide which 12 hours a day you want to work yeah. <laughs> but you still work 12 hours a day and you have to love what you're doing for that 12 hours or you're wasting your life. Um, so that would be one thing I would say is you don't have to find your passion. I think that's a catchphrase these days. That's very dangerous because there are lots of days when I'm not passionate about whatever it is that's on the docket for the day. Um, they're the things that go with the things that make me passionate, right? Although you can design yourself to be much more like that. Um, the second thing I would say is, um, Oh, I had it. Now it's gone. Um, I, there's something in me that just wants to say, it's okay if it's hard. The world is selling you easy and fast and quick and all of those things. And it's like, it's okay if it's hard. Hard is part of life. If you're going to climb a mountain, there are going to be moments when it's hard and you still want to climb the mountain. Great. If you've chosen to climb one. Um, Good one. And the other thing is, you know, this is just my basic philosophy over deliver mm -hmm. under promise over deliver like, and, and say, I think what everyone who hires you wants to hear, regardless of what you're, they're hiring you for is I got you. <laughs> I got you. I gotcha and I care and, and I'm good at this. So you don't have to be, just let me hold you through it and, and make it happen, right? And that's not an easy thing, especially for entrepreneurs to, to do. Um, but 
to just let somebody hold you. If you hire someone, trust them to do a good job as best as possible. Don't hire the wrong people when your intuition says, I'm giving you a lot more than three. Sorry. <laughs> They're all good. I love it. Yeah. But, but over deliver from a standpoint of that doesn't mean bake, break your back and become a slave. What it means is be so good at your job that when you're done, they can point to what you did and you can say, yeah, you said you were delivering that and you did. And if you can't do that, get better at your job. Great, great way to end this. Thank you, Robin Rice. Thank you. I love you, Penola. <laughs> love you too. And ladies and gentlemen, for our inspiring entrepreneurs today, this was Robin Rice. Thank you for your time. You're unstoppable. You're unstoppable.